Welcome to the Atlantic Center for the Arts. The following is a reading by memoirist Peter Trachtenberg, who was a master writer for our 2012 Your Word Teen Writing Residency. And I want to thank everybody at ACA. I want to thank Ren and Jim Frost and Jim Zock and Nancy and Chef Tom and Adam for both for having me and for making this place such a great haven for the arts and for artists. Uh, it's really a pl such a pleasure to work with, with um, colleagues like Pam Houston and Jericho Brown and John and Nicole and Ricky. Um, you know, it really feels like a community. And speaking of communities, I especially uh, want to thank my group, Emily, Erica, Kara, Cassie, Maria, Rebecca, and Brenna, because you really restore my faith in writing, which sometimes wavers. It is really just a joy to be with, with young people who take it really seriously, but also know how to have fun with it, and who are willing to take risks and go to strange places, and who are kind to each other at the same time. That's, um, that's really um, a very renewing thing for me, so thank you. And I'm gonna read from my new book, Another Insane Devotion, that's coming out in November from DeCapo Press. And rather than talk too much, I've, I think I've mentioned um, that it's basically a book, it's about cats and love, or cats and love and marriage. I don't really know how to describe it. And I thought, I, I first saw her a week or two after some friends had rescued her from the woods across in their house. A small, matted thing hunched miserably on a tree branch in the rain while their dogs milled and snapped below. She was very sick with a respiratory infection, and for a while they didn't think she'd make it. By the time I came over to the barn where they were keeping her, she was stronger, but her face was still black with caked on snot. I sat down on the floor beside her, and the little ginger cat rubbed against me, and a moment later clasped my hand between her forepaws and began licking it. It wasn't the grateful licking of a dog. It was proprietary and businesslike, the rasp of her tongue almost painful. She was claiming me. F and I named her Biscuit after the color of her fur. She never completely got over the respiratory infection. Even in total darkness, you could tell she'd entered the room because of the snuffling, a sound like a small whisk broom briskly sweeping. Every few months, she'd start sneezing with increasing viscid productivity until it got so gross we had to take her to the vet, which she didn't mind. She'd stroll into her carrier as if it were the first-class compartment of an airliner and put, on her, put her on antibiotics, which she did. She hated being pilled and would buck and spit and slash until you got the message. You can see the scars she left on my forearm. Once, when we were still living in the town, Biscuit wandered into a neighbor's garage and came back with half her muzzle and one forepaw white with paint. Three people had to hold her down while the fourth shaved off the painted on fur so she wouldn't be poisoned while trying to clean herself. It was the angriest I ever saw. But only a few hours later, she slid into bed with us, snuffling and purring. This was our marriage bed, my wife's and mine. In it, we had made love, we had quarreled, We'd exchanged secrets the way children exchange trading cards. We had sat up reading by lamplight while the world slept, sometimes silently, sometimes aloud to each other. During the early years of our marriage, the books we read included Charlotte's Web, Oliver Twist, The Story of the Treasure Seekers, and the entire Lord of the Rings, which aged us like grief. We did the voices of all the characters, guileless, bumptious Wilbur, Manly Oswald, bluff as a little Winston Churchill. Templeton rubbing his hands, or I guess his paws, together in anticipation of an all-you-can-eat buffet of rotting midway garbage. Unctuous Fagin, his ill will barely concealed by a facade of mocking courtliness. Hissing, sniveling Gollum. Lately, we don't read to each other much. On September 29th, 2008, while I was away teaching at a college in North Carolina, I learned that Biscuit had gone missing from her house in upstate New York. F was also away at the time at an artist's residency, residency in Europe, so if anybody was going to look for a cat, it would have to be me. By rights, the kid we'd hired to take care of her pet should have gone looking for her, but he was useless. At least he was useless as a cat sitter. And so I booked a flight to New York and set off to find Biscuit, though I couldn't afford the airfare, and worried that by the time I arrived, it would be too late. She'd already been gone three days. 
a piece of information Bruno, the cat sitter, had held back until fairly late in our conversation. I don't know whether from caginess or because it had just slipped his mind. It was early evening when he called. I was making dinner. I remember looking out the window into the garden of my rental house, which lay in the shadow of the live oak whose acorns, bigger and flatter than the ones I was used to seeing up north, littered the grass like woody bottle caps. It may have been the shade or an approaching storm that gave the dusk a greenish cast. It was like being at the bottom of a well. What's the name of your orange cat, Bruno asked. I felt a surge of anger. He couldn't remember the name of a creature that had been sharing his home, whose home he'd been sharing for two weeks, a creature whose color was not orange but golden. F sometimes called her the golden kitty. But I just told him Biscuit. Her name's Biscuit because she's biscuit colored. <laughs> In much the same way, parents of missing children describe the clothes they were wearing, their birthmarks, the gaps between their teeth. I know that a child is a child and a cat is just a cat. I'm only trying to say that I'm one of those people who greets bad news politely, as if by doing that I could turn it away. A little over a year before we got Biscuit, my cat Bitey had died. She was the first cat I'd ever owned, or owned for more than a few months. A smoke black domestic short hair with an underbite that gave her a look of implacable, scheming malice, like Laurence Olivier playing Richard III. When F and I moved in together back when we were still girlfriend and boyfriend, Bitey took an instant dislike to Tina, the younger and more timid of F's two cats. Scarcely had we let them out of their carriers than Bitey slipped out of the room where we'd stowed her and shot down the hall into the room where we were keeping Tina. She must have smelled her in passing. Shrieks rent the air. If any shriek can be said to rend the air, it's a cat's. The shrieks of all other creatures only perturb it a little. We separated them, that is, we drove Bitey away from the bed under which Tina was cowering. But from then on, she spent much of her time lurking outside what we came to call Tina's room, waiting for the little orange cat to tiptoe out. And she really would tiptoe, lifting her paws very high and placing them down as if stepping onto the wrinkled surface of a barely frozen puddle so she could menace her with her wicked plantagenet jaw. Some of this aggressiveness had been apparent even when I adopted Bitey from the Baltimore ASPCA on a wet day in April 12 years before. I remember the statue of St. Francis in the shelter's garden shining with rain. She was just a kitten, barely larger than my fist, and so black she seemed featureless except for her green eyes. My girlfriend held her to her breast as I drove home. Dee had a cat of her own that she could handle like a slab of bread dough, but before we'd gone three miles, the kitten had squirmed out of her grasp and was pacing along the backs of the seats, mewing. Dee tried to pull her down, but she clambered on top of my head and sank her claws into my scalp. She meant no harm by it. Still, her claws were sharp, and I cried out in pain. The black kitten continued to cry out in whatever it was she was feeling. Fear, probably, and misery at being shut up in a hurtling cage without her brothers and sisters in it. Just two large humans rank with tobacco, toothpaste, deodorant, and shampoo, their mouths brutal with teeth, their nostrils like caves. A week or so later, after she'd gotten used to me, I had some friends over for dinner. She pranced fearlessly from one to the other, making warlike feints at their hands. My friend Charlie wagged his finger at her, and she nipped it. Wow, that's a bitey cat you got there, he said. Up until then, I'd been calling her Bridget, but the new name fit her better. At the time I got Bitey, I'd recently entered a new phase of my life. I thought a cat would be part of it, a bolt on the door I'd shut on all the misdealing and unhappiness that had gone before. A cat would force me to be regular in my habits. It would force me to consider desires other than my own, which up until then had been my main, maybe my exclusive subject of interest. I'd had other cats before this, but only in the sense that the singer of Norwegian Wood once had a girl. <laughs> they were cats I found on the street or in apartment buildings and kept for a while, feeding them more or less regularly, cleaning their boxes, but then got tired of, or more to the point, overwhelmed by, and passed on to other caretakers. There was the one who began crying like a rooster at first light, 
which was only two or three hours after I'd gone to bed. She didn't last too long. There was the silent gray male who scratched my girlfriend T while she slept. There was the orange female I named Jasmine who once woke me up with an ominous scraping. I thought someone was trying to break into my fourth floor apartment that turned out to be the sound of her empty food dish being pushed, butted really, all the way from the kitchen to the bedroom. I liked those cats all right until they got to be too irritating. I didn't think of them much afterward except maybe for Jasmine, who one night while I was out pushed aside a window screen and then in all likelihood leaped to a neighboring rooftop or maybe onto the towering ailanthus tree in the courtyard whose branches reached almost to my floor and from there flowed to the ground and melted into the dark. Wherever she went, I hope she found an owner who paid more attention to her and fed her when he was supposed to. <clears throat> from the very first, Bidey interested me in ways her predecessors hadn't. She was an entertaining presence. For one thing, she fetched, preferring the crumpled cellophane wrappers of cigarette packets to all the toys I used to buy her in the pet aisle of the supermarket. Maybe the crackling reminded her of small animals stirring in the brush. She could hear the sound anywhere in the house and would come trotting up to me whenever I opened a fresh pack, her tail twitching with eagerness. Unlike a dog, she wouldn't drop the cellophane in your lap or even at your feet, but oh, was far enough away that you'd have to get up to retrieve it. I don't know if this was out of the same caution that makes a cat reluctant to eat from a human hand or because, having scrambled around the room in pursuit of her prize, swatting it from paw to paw, levering it with surgical dexterity from under a baseboard, lofting it into the air and then showily leaping after it, caroming off walls and vaulting over the furniture or skidding under it like a tobogganist before finally seizing the bowl in her mouth, she wanted me to get off my ass too. Most intelligent animals seem to want to be entertained. This desire may be one of the constitutive features of embodied intelligence, a boundary that separates higher animals from lower ones and intelligent animals from intelligent machines. To date, we've seen no evidence that computers get bored, not even the really big ones designed to measure the expansion of the universe or track the firefly motion of leptons that take up entire multi-story buildings. By this standard, the crowning achievement of our species may not be writing or the pyramids or the cathedral at Chartres, all of which, face it, can be boring, but Grand Theft Auto. I'm not sure if it would be possible to make a cat understand what writing is for. I mean, maybe if you could somehow demonstrate that it was our way of rubbing ourselves against the furniture or alternatively of spraying. But I can also imagine, but I can imagine a cat staring raptly at Grand Theft Auto, especially on a big screen. When Bitey chased a ball of crumpled cellophane, as Biscuit chased cloth balls stuffed with catnip, she may simply have been practicing the behavior she'd need for hunting. But I think she was also engaged in something gratuitous and non-utilitarian that might be called fun. A 1954 study found that even Casper Hauser cats, cats reared in social isolation and without opportunities for visual experience, let alone play behavior, displayed normal predatory responses when presented with a prey-like moving dummy. Now let's leave aside the ethical implications of raising a young social animal in what amounts to solitary confinement and judging by the experimenters offhand without opportunities for visual experience, total darkness. From my own observation, I know that Bitey would go scrambling after a tossed projectile moments after she'd finished eating often with such abandon that she vomited in mid-pursuit. Her vomiting was brisk and without fanfare. Suddenly she'd break, her body would be seized by spasms that squeezed and stretched it like a concertina. These would be accompanied by gasps of esophageal exertion, though gasps leaves out the sound's distinctive Elvis Presleyan glottal stop. It was purely functional without the notes of outrage and self-loathing that characterize human retching, whose sound is always the sound of someone groaning, why, 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 in a filthy bathroom at midnight. <laughs> Bitey didn't wonder why. 
What had gone into her was now making its way out. When it came, she looked at it blandly, then shook her head and walked away. My girlfriend, Dee, had a dramatic personality. She wore her hair dyed platinum blonde and swept back from her forehead like a romantic composer's. She played the keyboards at three in the morning. She would fix you with hypnotic stares of desire or grief, her pupils big as jelly beans, waiting for you to jump her or apologize for the terrible thing you'd done to her. When she smiled, her mouth was shaped exactly like an upside down boomerang. The night we met, she watched me pour a bottle of wine down the kitchen sink. I think it was a Beaujolais Nouveau. The first time we made love was also marked by ceremony. We'd put off the moment for a while. I'd never delayed gratification of any kind before, just had it delayed for, or do I mean from me, dangled out of reach like a catnip toy. And I have to say that when you're the one who does the dangling, it drives the other person crazy. It drives you crazy. Like the old ascetics of the desert, you're intoxicated by your self-denial, not to mention your unexpected power over another person. Not that this was my reason for postponing sex. It had more to do with the new life that had begun only a day or two before I met Dee, one event following the other so closely that I thought of them as cause and effect. In my mind, Dee was the reward for my new life, which in its early stages was marked mostly by what it required me to give up. I want to wait, I told Dee. When we finally did it, it was the most powerful sex I'd had in my life up till that moment. In an old movie, <clears throat> it would have been symbolized by a shot of water crashing down the flume of a dam or steam surging through a pipe. With D, I wore my last Halloween costume, suffering miserably with one half of my face painted black and the other painted white. She wasn't the first woman I ever apologized to, but she may have been the first to whom I apologized because I was wrong and felt bad about it rather than just because I wanted to end a fight. I couldn't say what I was apologizing for. My moral proprioception was still coarse back then and could identify only the grosser transgressions. Still, I remember the remorse rising in me like nausea. Once, when we were fighting in the car while caught in traffic, I made a violent turn that brought one half of the tercel lurching over the curb for a second before dropping back with a tooth rattling thud, and Dee accused me of trying to kill her. On at least two occasions, she told me that she loved me more than air. One of these was at a birthday party before an audience of awing friends. Even now, I remember how my face burned with pleasure and embarrassment. The pleasure was pleasure at being loved, of course, but it was also indicative of my own taste for drama, which in years past had led me to many sad feats of clownish vainglory. The embarrassment suggests that my appetite for drama wasn't what it had been. When you're a little kid, grown-ups warn you that your eyes are bigger than your stomach, but there comes a time when that's no longer true, not because your stomach has gotten bigger, but because your eyes have gotten smaller. I love you more than air, Dee said. I said, I love you, and immediately felt at a disadvantage, as if I'd followed her inside straight with a pair of eights. Everybody knows that the thing to do then is fold. I did, but it took me several more months. I'm not sure why. One morning, I woke up and was no longer in love with her. Then she was gone, and I was left wondering what had happened to everything I'd felt for her, where I'd lost it. I often think that my relationship with Bidey might have been much different if not for something that happened in the first year I had her. I was alone in the house. It was an early evening in winter. There was a sting in the air. I was suddenly overcome with tiredness. I hadn't been sleeping much since I'd broken up with Dee and lay down on the couch in the dining room, resting my head on a padded arm. Bidey jumped up and settled on my chest. At first, she sat gazing down at my face then she lay down on top of me and stretched her forelimbs so that she was almost clasping me around the neck and began to purr. We stayed like this for a long time. I could feel her breath on my face. Abruptly, the phone rang, and I started up to answer it, jostling my cat from her place of rest and spilling her to the floor. She wasn't hurt. I mean, she was a cat, and cats routinely fall from much higher up without injury. But she never lay down on me like that again or clasped my neck in what I always insist was an embrace. I'm probably reading too much into that moment. I was lonely, 
and Bitey may just have been stretching. We think of love, at least love in its ideal form, as a reciprocal condition, like a current that requires two poles to make your hair rise. Without two poles, you can't even speak of a current. Unreciprocated love may not be love at all, but a delusion. Maybe a pathetic delusion, maybe a creepy one. I mean, stalkers, too, think they're in love. Well, if someone says, I love you, it's nice to be able to say, I love you back. This is more difficult than it sounds. In James Salter's Light Years, a little girl is writing a picture story. Margot loved Juan very much, and Juan was mad about her. But Margot is an elephant, and Juan is a snail. In the classical myths, humans and gods love one-sidedly, a predicament the gods usually solve by means of rape. The poor humans just pine. Tristan and Isolt may be the poster children for requited love, but even they needed a love potion. And it's significant, I think, that the love they came to embody, courtly love, has conditions so extreme as to be essentially unrealizable. It must be adulterous, it must be pure. The lovers must love equally. We have to speak of such love the way we speak of black holes. Who knows what happens to someone who enters a black hole? Is he crushed by its gravity, which is massive enough to crush stars? Do its attractive forces wrench him in two or draw him into a wire of infinite length and infinitesimal thinness and stretch him across all space and time? What message does that wire transmit? And who hears it? There was a moment when F and I loved each other equally, when we looked at each other with eyes whose pupils were similarly dilated. F's pupils were easier to see because her eyes are blue. Mine are dark, and this makes the state of the pupils more elusive. There are nights when I wake beside my wife as if beside a stranger. Her body is familiar to me. I know it almost as well as my own. Maybe I know it better, having looked at it and touched it with greater attention than I ever gave myself, because I wanted to know it. There have been few things in my life I've wanted to know so badly. But something's gone wrong. Two years ago, she asked for a separation. A while later, she changed her mind. I couldn't tell you why. Or rather, I could tell you. Because of the children we didn't have or the child we borrowed. Because of the kitten we rescued and then lost because of money, because of sex, because I didn't pay enough attention to her, because I paid too much, because she got bored and then got interested again. But any of those explanations would be wrong. Now it's my turn. I don't know what to do with F. I look at her the way you look at a house you were thinking of moving out of. It's gotten too small for you. It needs a new furnace, the floor slants. Why do you stay? but how can you ever leave? They lay in the dark like two victims, Salter writes, of a husband and wife. They had nothing to give one another. They were bound by a pure, inexplicable love. If they had been another couple, she would have been attracted to them. She would have loved them even. They were so miserable. I remember when people still spoke of couples as being estranged. Miss Taylor and Mr. Burton are estranged. The term is passed out of use, unfortunately because it is so accurate and absent of blame, saying nothing about which party has become the stranger, and leaving implicit the fact that when one falls out of love, as when one falls into it, one becomes a stranger to oneself. Proust describes that earlier estrangement well when he has Swann realize with an inward start that he has fallen in love with Odette, whom only a little while before he found a little boring and her beauty a little worn. He was obliged to acknowledge that now, as he sat in that same carriage and drove to Prévost's, he was no longer the same man, was no longer alone even, that a new person was there beside him, adhering to him, amalgamated with him, a person whom he might perhaps be unable to shake off, whom he might have to treat with circumspection, like a master or an illness. I gaze down at my wife in the dark, but see only the dim curve of her body lying on its side like a letter C, a face shuddered in sleep. I go into the bathroom and turn on the light above the sink. My face in the mirror is the face of a tramp rousted from a ditch. I lean closer and try to make out the size of my pupils, but of course the sudden brightness has made them pin. 
In mechanical terms, there's something they don't want to see. The door creaks, I turn an alarm, but it's only our plush silver tabby Zuni, that fool for running water, shouldering her way inside. She hops expectantly into the sink. I turn on the tap for her. She laps without a glance in my direction, like a duchess so used to being ministered to that she no longer notices the servants and sees only a world where objects dumbly bend to her wishes. Doors opening, faucets discharging cool water, delicious things appearing in her dish. Is it that I don't know F anymore or that I don't know myself? Maybe it's love that has become strange to me. I can't recognize it in another person. I can't find it in myself. It has become my lack. But this seems to be true of many people, of Salter's glamorously wretched married couple, of Swan trembling at the loss of his faithless mistress, whom he will marry only when he has fallen out of love with her, of all the seekers who crawl and flounder after this one thing, turning over wives, husbands, lovers, mistresses like rocks in a garden, under one of which, long ago, they buried a treasure, or maybe just a dream of treasure. What is this treasure? It took me about 22 hours to travel the 1,400 miles from the town where I was teaching to the mid-Hudson Valley and back. That's one of the drawbacks of flying on a discount carrier. To Biscuit, the distance would be as incomprehensible as that between the earth and the sun, whose warmth she loved to bask in when it poured through the living room window on winter afternoons. Though come to think of it, you hear stories of cats traveling long distances all the time. Usually they're trying to return to a former home or be reunited with a missing owner. To me, why Biscuit wandered off and where she went are, well, if not incomprehensible, unknowable. Still, I can recount just about every step of my search for her and many of the key incidents of her relationship before then. This is more than I can do for my relationship with F, which at the time Biscuit disappeared was beginning to change and maybe to draw to an end. It's still too early to say. I recall that relationship at least as vividly as I do the one with Biscuit, if not more vividly. But as Freud showed us, there is such a thing as an excess of vividness. The most vivid memories, the ones most populous with detail and saturated with color, may be the least reliable. And my relationship with F may also be too complex to be easily narrated. Both of us can talk, and that means we can contradict each other. A cat can defy you, but it can't contradict you. I feel no real obligation to relate F's version of the events I lay out here. Still, when her version contradicts mine, I feel haunted. My past seems to belong to someone else, a self I'm only impersonating. Did I really do the things I remember doing? Say what I remember saying. And whom did I say them to? About my cat and the self I am with her, I have fewer doubts. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'll do a Q&A. Let's do about 15 minutes of question and okay. answer. Yes. How do you find it? Well, that is sort of how I work. My, um, I'm interested in putting together things that don't seem to fit together. And that way, that's why I really admire poets, for example. I mean, to me, what poets do is like the highest state of, of writing or of language. Um, and I couldn't tell you, I mean, I suppose I could like, you know, I could spell it out why I think they're similar. But at the beginning, it was just that they made sense. And they made sense in some deep place that wasn't here, but it was here or maybe here. And that's what I'm always interested in, is these connections that ring in pl different places. And then exploring that. And maybe after the fact, later on, I figure out what, how they come together. Yes, Erica. Mm -hmm. people who haven't been in that contact with her. Have you ever had someone 
talk to you about being mental? Health? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, for the most part, um, it's interesting. In, in Seven Tattoos, I wrote um, about a woman who, in the book I called my girlfriend, but it was actually my first wife. And I had changed who she was partly to protect her privacy. And I had told her at the time that the book, that I was, the book was coming out, that, she that a character based on her was going to be in it. And I would underline that, a character based on her. Because, you know, as, as Pam was saying yesterday, even when you write nonfiction books, you're not really writing life. You're writing a version of life. And, you know, I didn't hear from her. And then I ran into her, like, two years later on a train. And she actually said, you know, it was really hard to read, but you got me. It was true. That's what I was like. Um, which was a great compliment. It was, um, I do try to, like, if I'm writing about a real person, I let, let them know that I'm doing it. I will often show them what I'm writing, but I won't give them the option of changing it unless something is really wrong or libelous. But um, I sort of feel like give, give people a heads up. It seems that way, but I feel the same way. I mean, I feel like, like this is a weird thing because it, I will say that, the, that almost except for one thing, and that is a mystery I, I may talk about later. Everything in this book actually happened. Um, but at the same time, writing it felt like writing a novel. I felt there were certain things I could say and certain things I couldn't say. Part of it was because there is another real person aside from myself. So some of these things belong to her. Um, and I felt I had to be, guard that privacy. And the other is because I was thinking very much of the craft of the book. I was thinking about the book the same way you would think about a poem. I was thinking about the I who is telling this story as a character who has like the circumstances of my life, exactly the circumstances, but is different, is not really me as a character. Um, I actually prepared an answer because I'm sure that if this book gets any attention, like people will say, well, what about your actual marriage? And what I would say is that there are works of nonfiction that point very, very, in a very obvious and very urgent way at events in the real world. When I wrote about genocide tribunals in Rwanda, I wanted people to think of those real tribunals that were taking place in a real country that involved people who had really survived a genocide or who had, not, who had been implicated in it. So that was one kind of nonfiction. But there's another kind of nonfiction that's almost like building a parallel world to the one in which you live. It's like those comic books where there are parallel Earths. Um, and this, this book contains a parallel world. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the world in which I live, as opposed to the world that I write about, um, is off limits. And other people may not respect that, but I, you know, I'm pretty clear about it. And I think that anybody who writes or who really loves to read would get it, you know? But then again, it's, um, I think that one of the things that writers can do, I think that we have as a society gotten a, a little blurry about the difference between what goes on in books and what goes on in life. Um, and I think that with, with very destructive consequences sometimes, what would I like you to know? Um, that, okay, here's what I would say. That the world runs on stories um, that people like to tell them and maybe need to tell them and they need to hear them. That it's what's in a way, I think that the need to tell and hear stories is a drive, like the drive to, um, to eat and to sleep and to love. Um, it's maybe a, only slightly less powerful and urgent than those others. And I think that people die, um, at least figuratively, for lack of stories. And I feel that we are surrounded by a lot of false, and um, there's a word I love, meretricious stories, which means that stories are, that are deliberately misleading one way or another. And I think one of the things that you can learn as a writer is how to tell a truthful story. And that's whether you were telling, doing not reporting, or writing novels, or writing poems, that you can find a core of truth 
that stands up against the lies of the world. And that's what I would urge each of you to do, or try to do. Okay, thanks. <laughs>